Well, here we are on a sunny Monday with a biting wind, but a beautiful sun. And Pat McGart tells me it's the same thing in Donegal. Is Absolutely. that right? Absolutely. It's just the sun's come out again. I, I know it's bitterly cold. It's biting cold, but it's beautiful. It's like a, a sort of like a Canadian day. No uh -huh. sun shines, yet, uh -huh. yet it's cold. Uh, are you going to go out and face the elements later in the afternoon? Uh, yeah, I was, I was in all morning. The, the dear Mrs. is away doing grandchildren duty again today. Um, <laughs> so I'm on my own. But yeah. I have a few things to do outside, so I'll get out later. It's, I think it'll be a lovely day to get outside. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Nice, all right. Okay, let's go straight to the um, items we have for discussion because we have, I think it's four of them all together. Yeah. Uh, and we'll start with the obvious one, which is... Um, Bloody Sunday, which is, it's hard to believe it's 50 years, 50 yeah. years since yeah. Bloody Sunday. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk, well, not that much talk. I think they're keeping their powder dry, the, the TV yeah. media anyway, uh, uh, till, till near the time of, um, uh, till next Sunday, near to next Sunday. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on it, Pat? Can you, you remember... Where were you? What were you doing? Uh, you you know, I, I, I remember myself and my father and a couple of others. We actually went to a football match. We were in Ball of Fun Harps were playing somebody or other. And my father was, um, I've mentioned this before, a sort of a news junkie. So the minute we got into the, like it was a winter's day, so, and, and there was no floodlights. So we, when we got into the car, it was about after four o'clock, I'd say. And we were just about to come down the road and my dad put on the radio. And it was R RTE, I think around about four o'clock. This is reporter sort of coming in type bulletin of shootings in Derry. And I remember it very well. Uh, I remember when we got home that night, my father, uh, no, this is before remote control. He was over and back. He was switching UDV, RTE, BBC. Yeah. And it just continuous, continuous that night. We, sat, we all sat and watched it. Nobody went out. Nobody went anywhere. And, and no, I don't know. It, it was one of those occasions. Do you remember where you were when Kennedy was shot? Well, I uh, remember uh, Sunday very, very well. Yeah. I was eighteen, you know, or coming eighteen. Mm -hmm. And it, geez, Judith, uh, you know, when I thought about, I grew up in Letter Kenny, and I thought twenty miles up the road. Judith, one thing that a lot of people forget: there was a hundred bullets uh, uh, fired that day by the Parachute Regiment. When you think about, it, we talk about thirteen dead and one day later, but geez, Judith, we could have been talking a uh, hundred people dead. Imagine hundred people dead and so the size of there. Yeah, well, there was enough. I, I, I was in Canada the time it happened. And I remember the same thing, you know, the news coming in. Uh, first of all, there's been some shooting in Derry and that wasn't unusual on bulletins. Mm -hmm. And then they said there's been fatalities. And then they said uh, there's been a number of IRA men have yeah. been killed. And that, Actually, was the, line, the, the, that was the line yeah. that kept going the whole yeah. time. Yeah, before the day was out, the British Embassy in Washington had put it out the line that the army had shot dead bombers and uh, and gunmen or gunmen and bombers, whichever the came first. And uh, you know that that, that was, but it should. I actually um, I'm mentioning this to but I did a MA some years back, I could, 30 years, 20, 30 years ago. And one of the things that was I had a look at this whole thing about propaganda. And you, you know, this the British sent out that, but Bishop Daly, one of the people who helped me when I was doing the MA was Bishop Daly, and he had got uh, or received media reports from all over Europe and some from America. You know the big lie that there were bombers and gunmen? No, none of, nobody in the world believed it because there's a guy, I think he's called Gilles Perez. I think he was a French photographer. There was another guy, an Italian reporter, and they said it was sheer bloody murder. They didn't even bother, you know. And now there was, I think it was Simon Winchester and The Guardian, who was very brave, who refused to, uh, as far as I remember, and, they, and there was somebody possibly in the mirror as well, no British so, who didn't quite buy the, the, the version that the British were putting out. So, Jude, like, Jude, but here I'll ask you a question much more. You know, there's, there's Blue Mon or Lamon, the bombings, there was Oma, there was Enniskill. Do you, do you regard Bloody Sunday as the seminal event of the uh, Troubles? And, uh, or do you just regard it as another event in the Troubles? Oh, during the oh no, yeah, I, I regard it as a se seminal, as you say. Um, it should have been more seminal, if you like. Um, it, it, it provoked outrage. I, I remember feeling just some of the fact that it happened in Derry, and I knew Derry well, um, yeah. really dug into me. 
And I, I suspected, well, I didn't suspect, I knew from the beginning that there were bloody lies. And the reason I knew that the British were putting out lies, and then the Canadian media accepted it. They didn't make a big thing of it, but they just reported it. You know, a number yeah. of gunmen and uh, IRA, well, not volunteers, IRA men have been shot yeah. dead. Uh, they just accepted it kind of passively. Uh, yeah. But I, I, I was struck by the fact that on TV, there was people like Mulvey, Father Mulvey, and Eddie Daly coming on and saying, you know, we accuse the British Army of having killed people in cold blood. Yeah. Uh, now, the clergy and the AI knew were no friends of the IRA. Yeah. Oh, yeah. contraire. Oh, contraire. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so if they were saying that they, these people were killed in cold blood, it was obvious. It was obvious with Eddie Daly waving that uh, white hanky uh, that yeah. it was murder. It really yeah. was. Uh, outrageous. And the thing that drives me nuts is that nobody has served a day. And when they fingered one guy, uh, Soldier F, Your F. Uh, yeah. he's dead now. My God, in loyalist areas, everybody, uh, we support Soldier F, parachute regiment flags, etc. So I, I feel it was, um, it was a seminal day, but at the same time, like there was outrage throughout Ireland, right? The British embassy yeah. was burned in Dublin. Burned in Dublin, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, uh, that sort of was a peak. Uh, I mean, it did great things for the IRA recruitment in the north. Absolutely. But apart from that, really, if you compare it with another event where terrible sort of blood flowed, and that's 1916, mm. the fact that the leaders of the rising were um, executed really incensed the entire country. And you had an yep. uprising that went on, yep. a war of independence or the Tan War, whatever you want to call it. That didn't happen with Bloody Sunday. It, it went to a peak, I think, with the burning of the British Embassy, but then in the South, it subsided. What you got was a very strongly reinforced IRA who were able to carry yeah. on the struggle for years, decades. But yeah. it wasn't quite the same thing as uh, could have happened if, if Ireland had remained outraged. You know, it was yeah. a passing rage. Yeah, that's my, yeah that's I, think my the, I think the I think the government clamped down on it too in the south because they were scared of how far it was going to go. Yeah, but the other uh, yeah. well, look. First of all, uh, you had the civil rights people being battened off the streets by the authorities. Then you had an internment, which was totally bigoted and sectarian. Only Catholics were interred, or interned. And then uh, the third thing was Bloody Sunday. Any the attempts are the claims by the British establishment that they were honest brokers in this conflict. Yes. Like, dude, that stage it was totally gone. And they ah. just lost. Dennis Bradley, uh, I remember talking to Dennis, Dennis, who in, in fairness to him became vice chairman of the policing board, but he had he was a young priest in Derry at that stage. Now he left the priesthood later on, but I remember talking to Dennis and Dennis telling me that he says, after Bloody Sunday, he says, any uh, attempts by the Catholic Church to rein in the young men in the city, he says, they had lost all power and influence with uh, the young people. And, and attempts uh, by the Catholic Church to say, go the non-peaceful route, he says, were actually derided. You people for real type thing was the comment and so on. So after that, Jude, uh, your point was the reinforced IRA, and that's what gave them the, the, to carry on. But the other thing, Jude, it was the only attempt, one of the reasons I say that Bloody Sunday was seminal was it was the, case, the only case that I know of where they shot people in cold blood and full public view and then blamed the people for their own deaths. Yeah. In other words, the per perpetrators were innocent and the innocent were guilty. Well, I was listening, I was watching a, yet again another uh, replay of that moment when the paratroopers went into the box yeah. site. And uh, you hear this officer's voice shouting, yeah. Do not, fire, do not fire, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, do not it. fire, yeah. until you are fired on, or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Do not return fire, maybe that was the line. Yeah. But essentially what he was making very clear was there was fire being directed at the British Army. Yeah. Now, I wondered, one, did he say that because he knew it would be picked up? Or two, is it conceivable that that sound track was laid on top of that footage. Is that too I, soon? Dude, I can't answer that, but uh, I'll tell you the, the, the famous one in America. I know the, uh, the when the cops are uh, arresting some black man uh, and they sort of have his foot in their neck and they beat the crap. And the, the famous line they keep saying is stop resisting. 
Well, even if you watch, the person isn't resisting. So, uh, Jude, uh, that I often wonder was that you know um, that line. Uh, don't do not fire, like Jude. There, there's absolute. Savile had an inquiry, and there's you know um, the people like McGinnis said the, the IRA were under orders to uh, put the guns away. Uh, they, I think they put them up about the Craigan Reservoir and so on, so on. And Jude. Of all the years, no one has ever, and there was all sorts of rumours put about by certain people, but nobody's ever produced a photograph of a gunman on Bloody Sunday or anything like that. So I, I'm taking it. And you know, the other thing, of course, the conclusive thing, not one soldier suffered an injury or a gunshot wound at all, yet they fired 100 shots. And what, 27, 28 people were actually shot. Some gun battle, Jude, when uh, not a soldier was shot. And quite a few of the people who were defenseless were shot in the back. So like, I'd sort of, if you take uh, all the facts, you sort of go, wait a minute. No, there's fact and there's fiction. Aye. The, the, I think that you're right that that point, at least for me, it made fairly clear that uh, the, the notion of the British calling themselves a peacekeeper between warring tribes yeah. just bit the dust that day yeah, and yeah. the second thing is you say that that none of the soldiers were or, or uh injured in any way not even a stretch I mean, and yet they said they were making these claims about ira man not only that but 40 50 years later not one of them has had a scratch so to speak legally no now what sort of nonsense is that what yeah. sort of crazy nonsense how did they get away with that because I mean, we don't they're still at it. There was uh, uh, this whole thing about the legacy issue that Brandon Lewis. Dude, that's not about uh, on the and we or not, I'm not any four or or two listeners, but that is not about the justice. It's about ensuring that the British state and it's served because the old Tory right wing can't take the fact that maybe their soldiers should be held responsible for what they did. Well, I think actually it tells you something about the view that the Brits have of Irish people in Ireland. Yeah. You yeah. know, they really, if that had happened in Manchester or yeah. if that had happened in Dorset or London or Edinburgh or anywhere, it, it would not have stood. It just would not have stood. But because of that strip of water, crazy Irish killing each yeah. other, mad guys. Well, you, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not 100% certain that anymore. When I watch what happened in Hillsborough, you know, after with the Liverpool supporters, dude, the establishment, like, I think they have this idea that the working class are just scum and they can be manipulated. You know, the, the way that the 96, you know, like, there's there are parallels that are there too. You know, the establishment covered up, you know, the police and the, yeah. the government working together. Do you yeah, know, man? Yeah. And, you know, when I look back in the Irish history, you know, we always have to look, look at the way the Brits treated theirs. Then you look at the Highland clearance, clearances, uh, and you look uh, at the tall puddle martyrs, you mm. know, and all those sort of people who people sent off, you know, the guys, the Luddites, who were sent mm. to, uh, you know, transported to Australia. You know, all those sort of things. They treated their own. You know, the old establishment, hang them, you know, and sort of frighten the, frighten the sort of the natives. You know, it's, uh, mm. I, I'm, I'm not 100% convinced anymore. I think there's old British establishment. They're just... The uh, rule uh, by fear and thuggery. Of course, of course. Um, the one thing it was clear was that if anybody was going to be blamed, I mean, the the, the Savile inquiry, you knew from the beginning. If anybody was going to be blamed, it would be the guys who pulled the trigger, maybe. Yeah. But yeah. in fact, even then, that wasn't successful. But no way was there going yeah. to be the higher ups, Wilfords, yeah. etc., going to be uh, right. put, in the, put in the dog. Yeah. Terrible. Anyway, you, know, you can okay. talk about it until Christmas, yeah. but uh, it was a, a very uh, a seminal moment, all right. Um, mm -hmm. In ways, I do feel disappointed that the uh, people of the South, you know, they vented their spleen or their anger on the British Embassy, and then that was kind of a, um, you know, it, 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 that was it, really. That was it. it. Yep, that was, that was it. Yeah. Dear, dear. Tough to think of it, Ian. Tough to think of it. Anyway, anyway, okay. It'll be very interesting to see what happens. I gather um, Jeremy Corbyn is coming over for the... Yeah, he's given the, main, he's given the main address on Sunday. Uh, and I think there are a couple of other uh, heavy hitters as well. Uh -huh. Okay. Right, let's move to uh, a more recent um, event. Um, and that is the tweet sent by Doug Beatty. Now, Pat, 
Do you have you seen the tweet sent? No, no. In fact, I was hoping you had, but the <laughs> talk, talk, talk back today wouldn't even repeat it. So no, I was hoping no. you could inform me what was so uh, so deranged about okay. the tweet that poor Dugs and Muller. All I know is that I could pick this up from Talkback, of course, uh, in bits and pieces. Was that it was a treat to Edmund Putz, uh, making a joke of Edmund Putz, Edmund Putz's wife, and a brothel. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, how how that was arranged or what way it was, but that was the, that was the joke. And yeah. then he he sent it on. Was it Saturday night? And Saturday then and was was through it yesterday morning. Aye, and was um, said, oh, we really shouldn't have done it. it was terrible and so on. And today it occupied huge amount of time on Talkback. People were ringing in and were very, they were making the link actually and saying, this is misogyny. And that's the that yeah. same kind of misogyny that happened when Ashley Murphy was killed. Yeah. What do you think? Judah, you know something, I, I am uh, very conflicted about this. I think we're, you know, right. I have no time for misogyny, but I don't think, I think it's a quantum leap from a, a joke to the killing of Ashley Murphy. And, you know, I do sort of start to worry that uh, anything now that's vaguely uh, uh, sort of humorous uh, is sort of stamped on because it's... Now, I, when I watch comedy programs now, you know, all these guys making a, a politically correct observation, I think they're about as funny as a dose of the clap. You know, I, I mean, really you're getting old, Pat. You're getting old. I, I, you're getting I, old. You know something? Yeah, I'm well aware of it. I would nearly go back to the days of anti Irish jokes because at least there was <laughs> some humour. You'd see these guys getting up like Michael McIntyre and Darrell Breen and all this observational stuff. And they're because now they're so scared of uh, you know, the woke generation. Now, I am not tot uh, uh, totally against racism, or, uh, but you'd, I think it's getting ridiculous. Now, I am not sure what the hell Doug Beatty sent, and it could be seriously offence. I just don't know. But, uh, you know, I, I think one of the reasons that uh, idiots like Trump got where they are was because there's a sort of a backlash against this political correctness. Mm -hmm. And Trump sort of, and, and, like the last thing you want to encourage this, but you'd, uh, it's very hard to explain. You sort of go and wait a minute, as, as everything offensive nowadays, like where is, you know, what, what's allowed to be fun anymore? Do we just beco all become totally colorless, totally bland, say nothing, do nothing, you know? Uh, no, that's not a, a green light for racism or sexism. Yeah, we have to remember, you see, um, there were jokes that were told when I was a kid about uh, people of a different color. Yeah, I remember all that. Well, yeah, jokes, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. I remember being in England and the guys working in the factory in the summer, and the guys referring to us all as Paddy. Paddy, yeah. hey, Paddy, get this. And I remember there was a guy from the South and I said, oh, you give out and he was effing and blinding. That guy said, oh, I'll call me Paddy. And I remember thinking, ah, for God's sake, give it a break. You know, who cares yeah. what they call it? Yeah. Uh, that was my view. But uh, I think over the years, uh, I, I see it as a part of a kind of a pattern of patronizing or of seeing it as a funny sort of kind of interesting, uh, jokey person or tribe or yeah. people. Uh, and maybe for that reason, it shouldn't happen. But I'll tell you, Pat. They, they're a line or a connection seem to be established, however tenuous, between the sex joke or the, the sex tweet yeah. and the killing of Ashley Murphy. Now, mm -hmm. to me, that doesn't make, that makes as much, there is a connection, of course, in a way, but it, it's the same kind of connection as there is between having a, a marijuana cigarette in your mouth and doing mainlining on heroin. Yeah. It's both drugs. But one yeah. is appalling. Uh, the other yeah. is something that any number of people do. I did one. It's sort of a, it's a sort of a quantum leap. Jesus, you know, you know someone. I remember the story one time. Uh, they were setting up a, a, a that was called the Chico Factory, at Bongrana, and they were making some sort of um, web or uh, a vehicle. That uh, by the way, it never happened. And but one of the protests, I remember somebody was saying, "Oh, this could be used in the wake uh, and a as a vehicle of war," and somebody says, "Yeah, so can a knife and fork." You know, uh, you know, uh, you can stab somebody with a kitchen yeah, knife. Yeah, like, yeah. You, you know, you can you, you can make anything link to if you yeah. really want to go for it. And yeah. I sometimes say, no, Jude, you have to. I am totally aware of the fact that you can, you can come across as sounding like a, a sort of curmudgeonly old man and someone like this. And I'm, mm -hmm. and I, like, 
see the killing of Ashley Murphy and stuff like that. There's, there's, uh, and some of the, some of the sex, sexist stuff I've seen on on uh, social media is is absolutely appalling and so on. But I am saying, wh- where do we draw the line? Is it, uh, even a, a sort of slightly off white joke now? Is it? Does everybody pile in and say, oh, um, how terrible? Yeah. yeah, that was a question I was going to ask you, Pat. Do you think you can have a sex joke, what we used to call a dirty joke? Um, yeah. That's funny. Do you think you can yeah. have that? Well, I, I am sort of saying definitely. Should I want to laugh? And I don't. No, hold on. Uh, you sort of. Say, you see, everything now is turned into the least. Uh, uh, the, my, you know what? What's left to laugh at anymore? If you crack any joke now, oh, that's terrible. I heard. You know, he's, uh, Ruth Dudley Edwards. Now, you know, when she said it wasn't misogynist, I'm sort of inclined to think it probably was because anything <laughs> she's for, I'm against. But uh, no, she come on, and then uh, I think who was the guy? Um, uh, the former. A UUP guy said it was mildly misogynistic. He says, but he says it, it wasn't Doug's finest hour, hour to retweet it. Uh, uh, well, I, I, I think the DUP must be the one group that is delighted. Absolutely. They must be delighted because um, Doug Beatty was caught doing something that he shouldn't have done. He should have known. He probably was, dare I say it, he might have, he might have been, what would we say, relaxed on a Saturday night. And, and, and left on his guards, yeah. Aye, and sent, sent out the tweet. So the DP had been delighted, but there's a certain irony there too, because he, they're delighted that they think they've got uh, Doug Beatty as a misogynist or elements of misogyny. Right. But the DUP themselves are famous, have been for years, oh, as geez. being contemptuous of women. Who was it that did the mooing sounds every time one, somebody from the Women's Coalition got up to speak in the Assembly? Yeah. Yeah, and, and the other one, remember we've had uh, Puts when he was congratulating Arlene Foster. He says, remember her most important <laughs> wife her, and mother. Her first you know, duty would be to be at home looking yeah, after yeah, the wings. Yeah, looking after the wings. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, we're agreed that, um, that um, uh, what do we call them? Smutty jokes can be really funny. I, I'm going right. to tell you one after, Pat. I'm not telling you. Yeah, I'm not telling you. I, I, really, I <laughs> laughed my leg off and heard it. <laughs> okay. We, I think we've put ourselves in the, in the dock on that one, Pat. We could be, probably. We could yeah, be in trouble. We could be in trouble. Yeah, but I'll put, you, I'll, I'll put you out the door first and see what happens. I, I talk to him. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, your next item on the agenda is booze. Because um, the South has put up the price of booze uh, drastically, I gather, because yeah. some people were saying, that if you bought the same thing, whether it was lager or whether it was brandy in the north, that it was yeah. just about twice the price. Is that right? Yeah. You think? yeah. Judge, uh, I was reading a thing in the Irish Times this morning, and it says the, uh, they, they, they did some sort of, they interviewed somebody, and they said, every second car in Asda and Fermanagh yes, I, I, Saturday, I and Saturday was Southern registered. Mm. Jude, I was in Derry uh, uh, last week, sometime early in the week, and I was I was at a certain supermarket, and I happened to notice that's geez, so well at a southern car. In fact, every car I noticed was southern registered. Mm-hmm. And then um, my dear missus went into uh, a shop in Donegal, no, Bal Buffet, a couple of weeks ago, and she was going to get a bottle of wine and a bottle of whiskey, <laughs> which is. And then she looked at me, she came back and she said, "Why am neither?" And I says, "Why?" She says, uh, "The whiskey in whatever the, the shop was, she says, is twenty eight euros. She mm-hmm. says it's about twenty quid." Or 18, I think, someone 18, 19, 20 quid in the north. And she says, even with sterling, she says, there's a four or five quid difference. And she says, the wine that used to be someone like, no, um, 4.99 or someone, is now 7.99. Now, this is all to do, I, I take it, with the minimum pricing introduced yeah. in the south there around at the start of the year or something like that. Mm. And, and now you, uh, like the price of uh, booze, Jude, you used to be able to buy cheap beer. Now I think every can you have to pay something like 140 or something. Uh, well, the, the, the thinking behind this is that the supermarkets were selling booze so much cheaper than the pubs. And yeah. the idea was uh, that that was uh, encouraging drinking. And drinking is a problem in Ireland, as we know. And yeah. this would help to solve it. Now, I must say, at the weekend, my son sent me, he's in the States, and he through Amazon here, sent me a book that we'd mentioned, he'd mentioned to us on, on a Zoom call. And I said, oh, you shouldn't have spent that money, you know. Uh, and yeah. he said, well, he's nearly 40. And he said, uh, well, I'm at the stage in life where I'm, I'm happy to say that I don't have to check my budget before I spend 10 pounds. 
Uh, the point I'm making is, who's going to feel the edge of even the doubling of price of booze? It's going to be the poor people. Ah, the, rich kid, the rich people will ride right through it. If they want to drink, they'll say, oh, scandalous the price. Give me a bottle. You know, uh, they'll pay it. Uh, it's it's uh, not uh, a problem. You, you know some, uh, like, uh, um, okay, no, so I read somewhere. No, the first thing in the morning, take green tea rather than coffee and ruin about 75% of the joy you have. Already, I know you've lost already. You know, uh, you, you know, I am not sort of advocating everybody getting pissed up and all that. But hey, the big point is to see everything in this country when or in the Republic when they try and uh, do it. And, and now I think the motivation behind this was some sort of health kick by the government to yeah, try and yeah, go yeah, and yeah. lose. And I, I read there recently a uh, judge on the... Uh, the district courts in a booze was removed that but uh, the, the district courts would would close down that right. about 90 percent of the, the things that come before them are drink related right yeah. so, but you same how with you, medicine how you, how same with medicine same as doctors yeah but it's right see the other but how do you how do you work any sort of a, a, sort of society of, you know when there's two there's two legislations or two jurisdictions on the island when, when you know it was the same with covid uh, like Jude, there was a famous story that and the pubs, right about Christmas times, the pubs and the Republic were ordered to close at eight o'clock. And there's a wee village called Carndona and, and the North on his own. When the pubs closed at eight o'clock, there was a lorry, or not a lorry, a bus sitting outside, and everybody piled on it and drove up the, the 20 miles up the road to Derry and sure. went down until we, we small hours. So I, how, 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 do you, how do you work uh, uh, on an island? You know, a minimum price for a, 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 you know, a RF2 policies uh, simply doesn't work. If I use the, the words, the squealing pig, I'm sure yeah. you'll know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. That, One of the most pubs. famous pubs. Yeah. In Muff you know, yeah. I, it's only about a 10 minute drive or so from the border. Yeah. And, yeah. and when I was living in Muff briefly, all the guys from the, the from the north, from Derry, would come across the border. That was how they had their drinking sprees. Yeah. It was, was never uh, drinking in Derry, always across the border in Donegal. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I, I always thought that was a guarantee. You know the way that people used to lament about, oh, this is terrible, the diesel smugglers yeah. and how they're taking money out of that. It's, it's your money they're you're paying. You know, you're paying yeah. for this because it's coming yeah. out of the taxpayer's pocket. These yeah. guys are getting away with not paying what they should be paying. And I was, I remember thinking, I was saying, well, that could be solved overnight. Yeah. Make the price of diesel petrol exactly the same on both sides of the border. Yeah. End of smuggling. Okay. And yeah. of smuggling overnight. What's the point? Yeah. Nobody would do yeah. it. So, Not at all, no. But they wouldn't do that because that would somehow seem to too much of a harmony between uh, the North Harmony, and yes, dude. Unity even. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, have, I, I have to say I'm lawless in this respect. Anybody who smuggles, and this goes back to my childhood, anybody who smuggles, I take my hat off to them because it's yeah. been going on forever. My, my auntie, my auntie Peg, smuggling a, uh, a pot of jam in the depths of her knickers uh, coming yeah. across the border. Yeah. And that, that goes back to, to the border was established. Yeah. You know, well, you, we you, didn't you, ask for it. It's, 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 uh, the, the, a border on an island is artificial and God bless the wood. And if anybody can break that rule, go for it. Okay, well, leave, leave aside the border for a second now. Do you, do you think that this, uh, they're doing it in Scotland as well, by the way. Uh, do you think this increase in prices of booze Will deter people? Will will have an impact on uh, the drink problem, which is a problem indeed. No, I think it'd probably go back to your one. It'll affect maybe the poor uh, disproportionately. But like to, for a lot of people, like if a bottle of wine costs five ninety nine and now they're paying seventy nine and seven ninety nine, you know, I don't think it's going. Or, to, yeah, or even know. ten, even ten, you yeah. know. Um, uh -huh. The middle class can afford five pounds, you know. Ah, exactly. Uh, that's yeah. not a problem. But um, a lot of people seem to put a lot of faith in this, the putting up with the price. I, I just, I don't think that's going to work. I don't know? think so. I don't think so. Um, but again, they, they must have some research behind it because, as I say, Scotland is putting oh, a lot of their effort yeah. into the same thing. But anyway, they could, as I say, solve any problems it has with having the pricing the same, and it makes sense. So stupid. Yeah. Or either that, or else get rid of the border. And then yeah. you don't have a problem either. <laughs> okay, the last item on the program is this question of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. I want you to tell me about it, Pat. Uh, well, uh, apparently, uh, I think Margaret Ritchie and the Alliance Party and various others 
And now, Mark, that Lady is, Margaret Ritchie. Lady Margaret Ritchie of the ah, former right, leader okay. of the SDLP. Just that, 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 that because the offices uh, of the Deputy First Minister and the First Minister are exactly the same, they have the same re legislative responsibility, they have the same uh, powers, et cetera, et cetera. She, the v three, I think it was the Alliance, SDLP, and I can't remember who else, said that it should be renamed Joint First Ministers. Yeah, the DDP yeah. have turned it down. And by the way, the other thing is, well, let, let's get this clear. The, the uh, UUP haven't, agree, uh, haven't uh, indicated either whether they'd be willing to serve mm -hmm. under mm -hmm. a Sinn Féin first minister. <laughs> now, McGuinness, is, uh, if I remember correctly, way back in 2005. You do? You do he, remember he, correctly, uh, Pat. I remember, uh, yes. Uh, uh, he, he said that it should be that because uh, that it was actually a misnomer because mm -hmm. they, exa they have the exact same powers. It was at way, the time it, when they, it was at the time when they, uh, the DUP were making a big thing of voting for them to stop having a uh, Sinn Féin first minister. First and McGuinness yeah. said that if Sinn Féin did become the biggest party, his first act as a leader of that party would be to abolish the two titles and make it joint first minister. Yeah. And, you know, that clearly didn't satisfy them. Uh, it's almost it's almost like the thing of equality, isn't it? Where yeah. unionism in many instances feels that they're losing something by having the other lot equal to them. Yeah, I, that that is the big point. Uh, this whole debate is it's it's sort of, you know, what does it tell you about unionism when they uh, when they, they won't even uh, agree to, uh, to, you know, that the name should be changed? And it, it, it tells a lot about whatever sort of, uh, Jude, I'm currently reading um, Susan McKay's book. Um, it's not on, on settled paper, on, on yeah. shifting ground, I think it's called, yeah. um, Protestant on shifting ground. Yeah. Uh, you know, and this, this whole thing, uh, you know, uh, without superiority, I think unionism is lost. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a sort of a, a, politic, a, a polity or a politics based on, on dominance. That's right. That's right. And they made such a big thing of it in the past, you see, the whole importance of having a, a unionist first minister that now they, they, they can't handle the possibility of a Sinn Féin first minister because they've which said is, it's such is, a sign of dominance. Yeah. Like and, and, and then you see, if, the, if the polls are right, yeah. sorry, if the polls are right, there is going to be a Sinn Féin first minister. Aye. Uh, and I also suppose the fact that the Alliance and the SDLP are working to get the change if it was handed to the DUP, it would make the DUP look weak, that they had to get yeah. a bunch of alliance and SDLP people, nationalists and middle of the road people to get it for them. I, frankly, Pat, I'd say I th I'm beginning to seriously think that Jeffrey Donaldson is going to find a way or try his best to bring down Stormont before the election. Jude, you know something? I, 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 that's like Turkey's voting for Christmas. I think the day the DUP start making Northern Ireland run governable, the the the, the, the Brits uh, say right that's it they wash their hands and the rest I think as I, I've said it to you before Jude the the unions can do far more harm to Northern Ireland and uh, than the nationals could and Jeffrey playing that game uh, for me I think it just, well that'll be the end of Northern Ireland. The one thing I'm not clear about is and I think we mentioned this before is it possible for the Secretary of State the British Secretary of State to Keep Stormont in place till the election, Absolutely. even if the DUP yeah. walk out. I'm Absolutely. not sure what the deal is there. What's your Brandon Lewis has tried a couple of tricks, not least double jobbing. He's, you know, the legacy inquiry. Yeah. And, you know, he's, he's, yeah. he's trying to keep the DUP no happy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he'll keep them sweet. And I'm uh, even if, uh, and I, I'd say Jeffrey will find this just to bring it down before uh, because. Uh, the, the, uh, and what Article 16 and the protocol, he, he probably needs all, something to, yeah. to be, shore him up, you know, to be seen to be a strong man before the election. Uh, but, but then you see, yeah, but we, we, uh, if, if Brandon Lewis can keep it in place, if he's got the powers to keep it in place, um, yeah. it'll be interesting. Uh, anyway, anyway, we'll have to stop there, Pat. We, we, we've given enough wisdom to both our For, for one day, yes, yes. For one day. I mean, yeah. this is... Hard work. It's you know we're uh, yes, calling yes, on yes. our brain power, yes, and we yes, really yes. need to lie down in there. The darkened room now. Exactly. By the way, you, have, you still have to tell me that dirty joke after. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to press the button here and stop it now, Pat. So brace Bye. yourself. Good luck. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.